So as Dan mentioned, the topic of this uh, evening's lecture is the rise of populism in Europe. The Great Decisions, the Foreign Policy Association picks eight topics, very timely topics every year. And then um, campuses and communities around the country then organize talks and, and discussions about them. And certainly, the rise of populism is a very current and um, very important topic for all of the things that have been going on. And you might have heard a lot about populism and populist leaders and, um, and, and some of these people that are being elected in Europe. So that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, this evening and then, of course, uh, engage in um, some questions and discussion afterwards. So the first question that everybody might have is, well, what exactly is populism? And it's not something that's easily defined, and there's a lot of debate, a lot of scholarly debate. Is it actually an ideology? Is it an attitude? Or um, is it just really a protest movement in some ways? So there's not a lot of uh, total agreement with it. Some people say that it's an ideology that supports the well-being of the people. And so it, it sets up this idea about populists being the voice of the people in opposition to what they see as the elites. And those elites generally are the established political parties. It can often be academics, people standing up and giving talks about them. Um, and increasingly so, the media, who um, come under attack from a lot of populists as well. So it sets up that the people are good, there's the voice of the people need to be expressed, the elites, oftentimes in the United States, is the coastal elites, people on the East Coast and West Coast that don't really understand the heartland, and you see similar type of rhetoric in, in Europe as well along these things. Now populism, since it's not a clearly defined ideology, but can be an idea, an ideational sort of theory, can be both on the far left or on the far right. So we have movements, far left populism as well as um, far right wing populism. The far left tends to be anti-capitalist. They um, come out of a Marxist tradition in many cases. They um, see a lot of structural inequalities that are primarily caused by what they see as failures in capitalism. The far right, on the other hand, the right wing populists, tend to be anti-immigrant, they tend to be more xenophobic, they tend to have more authoritarian tendencies, um, and they're opposed to the liberal world order. This is um, the dominant political ideology in Western society that arose after World War II. And, um, and it's also, ironically, linked in many ways to capitalism. So there are some sort of social and economic similarities between right-wing populists and left-wing populists, which we'll talk about um, a little bit as well. Um, so to different degrees, both the right and the left of uh, these populists are um, opposed to what they see as sort of this liberal world order and the elites that have been running this in uh, the post-World War II era. Now, you might be asking, is this new? Is this anything new, or has this been going on? There have always been protest parties and people who are the voice of the people um, for a long time. And it certainly isn't. And populism takes different forms in different geographic areas and in different parts of the world. So um, scholars have identified, though, that modern populism, the more modern iteration of it, um, has its roots in the late 19th century. And, um, actually in the United States and Russia, where there were um, several populist politicians and voices and people who were pushing to be the voice of the people. So the earliest forms of populism really arose in uh, the late 19th century, came to rise in the early 20th century, but then after the war, it really found its roots in many ways in populist movements in Latin America. And there have been several waves of populism in Latin America. Um, the first wave after the Great Depression in the 20s, second wave in the 1980s and the 90s in response to economic crisis in the area, and then a third wave in um, the 2000s with um, perhaps most notably represented by these two gentlemen, uh, gentlemen Hugo Chavez of Venezuela and Evo Morales in Bolivia. However, I'm not gonna talk about Latin American populism because I think that'll be a discussion or a whole lecture for um, another uh, great decisions um, discussion. But I just wanted to point out and recognize that certainly populism has long roots in the Americas in this hemisphere. And, um, and there are sort of linking ideologies between um, Latin America and um, in Europe. So what is this liberal order then that a lot of these populists claim to be opposed to? 
Well, one aspect of it has to do with economic openness. So after the First World War, and particularly after the Second World War, and the Bretton Woods Conference in 1944, there was a movement and, um, at the Bretton Woods Conference about breaking down protectionism, opening up economies, um, economic trade, and interlinking currencies and uh, the economies of various countries. And the idea, particularly after the f both world wars, was that countries that were economically interdependent would be less likely to go engage in conflict or go to war. So there was this idea that there was a need then to break down nationalism, which was the root cause of World War I, and the need to restore the economies, particularly in Europe after World War II, and that would be necessitated by opening up the borders, not being protectionist, economic trade, and the formation of these new global institutions, like the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, the GATT. Um, another aspect of the liberal wor world order is political liberalism. And so liberalism here, not in the sense of liberal or conservative, but of guaranteeing personal liberties, right? So these are the things of personal liberties, freedoms, that um, are enshrined in many of the constitutions in the Western world, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of assembly, etc. And so these were guaranteed along with individual liberties as also part of this. And then the third aspect of the liberal world order is uh, a union or alliance of countries seeking common goals. So um, perhaps the best manifestation of this of late has been the European Union. Countries coming together in the common good, seeking agreements, seeking trade agreements, um, tariff agreements, but also perhaps things like the Iran nuclear deal, the Paris Accords, the Kyoto Accords, to address climate change. So it's about multilateralism, countries working together, as opposed to unilateralism, countries going sort of on their own. So this is the idea then that um, a lot of the populist um, parties that we see today say that they oppose. So you might be asking, well, why? What is the populist opposition to these? How is it that they view this uh, liberal world order? Well, what is their opposition then, for instance, to economic openness? They are, for instance, for protectionism and saying that we need to protect our own economy, we need to protect our own companies, our own businesses, and our own uh, industries. And by doing that then, you have to put tariffs on imported goods, you have to try to um, have more closed economies as opposed to openness that allows then trade or competition from other countries which they see as unfair. Problem, of course, is that can lead to trade conflicts or trade wars, but nevertheless, it's, um, the populist ideology is that this is important for protecting our people, our country, and our businesses. Their opposition to political liberalism, well, in particular here, it has to do with freedom of speech. And attacks on the press tend to be quite common um, amongst uh, populists. So this idea of fake news, Lügenpresse, which is a term that dates actually back to the Nazis in Germany, that um, is very prevalent in the discourse as being opposed to the change or the voice of the people. Right? So you, you hear populists around the globe attacking the press, the freedom of the press, freedom of speech, and implementing things to try to uh, crack down on the press and to try and crack down on the criticisms that they have um, of them. There are also, in some cases, uh, restrictions on freedom of religion um, and uh, freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. So anything that threatens perhaps the power, the authority then of these parties. Opposition to multilateralism. Well, Brexit is the best example that you can give of that, right? So um, it, Great Britain is in quite a mess right now. If you've been following it, I don't think anybody knows what's gonna happen and the clock is ticking. But one of the things that they have said is they don't wanna to have to follow the rules and the regulations and the guidelines of the European Union. They want to be free, they want to be sovereign to make their own trade deals, to make their own agreements with other countries and not have to abide by those of coming from the elitists in Brussels who are dictating everything um, for them. Other multilateral organizations that have come under suspicion or attack. NATO, there's been quite a bit of discussion about that. Our president, President uh, Trump, has said that, considered at one point, and perhaps the US leaving NATO, 
saying that we shouldn't be financing the security of Europeans when they're not paying their fair share. NAFTA, um, I think just this week, uh, the United States, President Trump said that he was going to end NAFTA, it's sort of to force the hand of Congress to ratify the USMCA, which I think is the new renegotiated form of NAFTA, and the Paris Accords, Iran nuclear deal, et cetera. So the, generally the idea is that populists are not in favor of these because it limits the sovereignty, it limits their ability to act as they see being in the best and interest of the people. So why? why? Where does this populist opposition then come from in, uh, in, in so many parts of the world? And I think there was a very interesting book by a British uh, journalist and um, uh, sort of, yeah, journalist, I guess you could say. He's not an academic, he doesn't teach, but uh, by the name of David Goodhart. And he published this um, book called The Road to Somewhere, The Populist Revolt and the Future of Politics. And he frames this about somewhere and anywhere, as he calls it. And he's, what he sees with the rise of populism is more of a cosmopolitan divide and tensions between two groups that represent more solidarity and those that represent a little bit more of diversity. The first group are the people he calls the anywheres. And these are people who, as the name suggests, are really at home anywhere. These are often young, very cosmopolitan, globally oriented people that can work in San Francisco, then move to New York, and then Dubai, maybe London, Paris. You have your laptop, you've got your frequent flyer miles, you're working for international, multinational corporations and are able then really to be at home and work and negotiate life in many different contexts. They're well-educated, very mobile. They favor this open sort of world order. And they've truly benefited from globalization. Um, this can be hedge fund managers. It can be people in, in, in various kinds of stock trading, um, other types of multinational organizations. Then there are the somewheres, the other people in this sort of equation that Goodhart sees. And he says these are people that tend to be a little bit less well-educated. They're more rooted in their lives. They value security and familiarity. And they have a much stronger group attachment, right? They might be ethnic, it might be local, it might be national. And they have much more ascribed identities, as he sees it. And so the somewhere people are people who can say, I'm from here, right? This is the culture. This is the place I grew up. And things are changing, and I don't like it, right, in many ways. Oftentimes, because of globalization, because of the openness, because of migration, because of free trade, because of factories closing down and moving and being outsourced to South America or to China, right? Whereas the somewhere people are people that are going to go where those opportunities are and don't lament then the loss of this sort of rootedness and identity, right? So populists then, Goodhart argues, have really focused on the people who have not benefited from globalization, sort of, for the lack of a better term, the losers of globalization, the people, not losers, but maybe those who have come out on the short end or drawn the short stick in the changes that globalization um, have brought about in the world. So having said that, I think it might be instructive if we take a look at um, this liberal world order from the view of the somewheres, right? So we know what the populist opposition is to this. We know what sort of the anywheres would say and the benefits of the liberal world order and openness. But how might these somewhere people view some of these particular ideas? And that is, what, what if, a question that um, Goodhart poses, what if the hostility to liberal democracy isn't so much that, but it's a frustration that it isn't democratic enough from that perspective? So economic openness from a different vantage point can be outsourcing of jobs. It can be depressed wages. It can be the dominance of transnational corporations that are making decisions that cause these companies to leave and then I suddenly lose my job just so that they can make more profit. It can be the decline of local businesses and local cultures for people in small towns that are not part of the coastal elite. Political liberalism. What might that look like from the viewpoint of the somewheres? Well, multiculturalism, right? Things are changing. A loss of local identity, a loss of local culture. Um, the rise of what 
populists refer to as parallel societies. That is, immigrant groups that come to a country and then sort of recreate their own cultural traditions, heritage, food, language, schools, etc., and that are not integrating and assimilating into society. The loss of traditional values and what they see as the imposition of political correctness, right? The need to not be able to speak your mind, not criticize these changes and how things are going about. And then multilateralism, what we really see here is the demise of the nation state, right? And this is something that populists have picked up on very much, that the nation state itself has less and less power, less and less sovereignty, less and less importance in exchange for these global organizations. The United Nations is one that often comes under attack, is make unelected officials that are making these decisions that affect my life. And you hear this a lot in Europe about the European Union and in Brussels. Now granted, the, Europe the politicians and uh, people who work for the European Union are, for the most part, at least in the European Parliament, are elected, but nevertheless there's this sense that I don't have any control about it. And there's these other supranational organizations that are making all these decisions that affect my life and I don't have any say over. Whereas if we could just take control back, then we can make things better, right? And this is very much the argument in Brexit as well that is going on in the um, House of Commons. For that. So that's sort of the roots and the ideas of populism. So I wanted to take a little bit closer look at some specific examples of um, populist leaders and some of the countries in which um, populism has really been on the rise a little bit and to explore what might be the case or what, what might be the particularity in those um, areas. So who are some of these populist leaders? Well, there's first what I call, just for a little bit of humor, the Western hair populists, right? That, and this is a highly under-researched area of the relationship between bad hair and right-wing populism. But, on your left here, you have Boris Johnson. You might recognize he's not, I don't know that I would call him necessarily right wing, but he's certainly conservative. He's a pro-Brexiteer. He was uh, aligned very strongly with Nigel Farage of the UKIP party and was lobbying very hard for Brexit uh, two years ago when that vote came about. The gentleman in the middle, I think we all recognize, the President of the United States. And the gentleman on the far right, you may not recognize, but is Gert Wilders, who is the um, leader of the Freedom Party in Holland. This is one of the more longer standing, older populist parties in Holland. It's very anti-immigrant, xenophobic, nationalist. He's calling for Holland to, if he were to get in power, for Holland to leave the European Union, just like Brexit. He's very much pro-Brexit because he sees that as um, sort of impinging on the sovereignty of uh, Great Britain. Um, then, of course, there are left-wing populists. So it's not all right-wing populists. Most of what I'm going to talk about is more from the right wing, but there are, as I mentioned at the beginning, some similarities between these two. These two gentlemen on the left are actually leaders in Greece. Um, Alex Tsipras, who is the president of Greece uh, currently, and this gentleman here you may have seen, who's been uh, somewhat of a media star a little bit, Yanis Varoufakis, who is the Minister of Finance in Greece. Um, very interestingly, he was a professor of economics at the University of Texas in Austin, uh, but is a Greek national and was called back to join Tsaritsa, Tsipras's party, and is now serving as the Minister of Finance. If you've seen, you can look on YouTube, some of his speeches, his English is flawless, but he's a pretty hard-lying Marxist and a very, very interesting guy to listen to some of his speeches. This gentleman here is Pablo Iglesias, who is the leader of Podemos in Spain, also a former academic, former university pre uh, professor in um, Madrid. So apparently the two paths to populism is either bad hair or university academics, I guess, is the, <laughs> the moral of this. But he has been leading an opposition party uh, more on the left um, in, uh, in Spain. So what then are some of the causes of populism? What has given rise to, we talked about globalization uh, a little bit, but what are some of the other things that have really then uh, been an impetus for some of these leaders? And in some ways, I think the recent rise of populism, right-wing populism in Europe, has kind of been a perfect storm of two things that occurred. The economic crisis, the downturn in 2008, and then the second crisis, or the wave of immigration that really reached a peak in 2015. 
In Western Europe, you see then the rise of populism as um, being one about the effects of globalization that I mentioned, also a rejection of austerity. This is um, the cutting back on uh, government spending, cutting back on the public sector. This was uh, something that was demanded of Greece, of France. Many in the minds, rightly or wrongly, Europeans associate this with Germany, although it wasn't entirely the Germans who implemented this, but Germany has been a strong advocate of austerity policies um, in Europe. And the after effects of both of these, of globalization and um, austerity. In Eastern Europe, though, it's a little bit different in that a lot of people who study the rise of populism in Eastern Europe see it as some of the consequences of the transition to liberal democracy. That is, transitions after um, the fall of the Soviet Union and the expansion of the European Union and sort of the struggles that a lot of uh, Eastern European countries have in developing these post-communist democracies. And particularly, so whereas the economic crisis was a big factor in Western Europe, the um, immigration crisis in 2015 was a big impetus for um, the rise of populism more so in um, Eastern Europe. Then of course you add to that the politics of cultural and identity, which are challenging traditional politics, and um, the economic austerity programs that were put into place in many of these countries that have radicalized both the right and the left. So that's one thing that unites them, that they're both opposed to austerity, um, but from different vantage points and different viewpoints. So let's first take a look at the economic recession. This is, um, some of you may recognize, as Madrid, the Puerta del Sol in uh, Madrid, at the height of some of the protests of um, the so-called indignados in 2011 who were protesting high unemployment that you had in Spain uh, that had reached by that time 21 percent, the official number, uh, austerity that was being imposed and the cutback in pensions, the cutback in the public sector, and also a plan to increase the retirement age from um, 65 to 67. So from that, there was a rallying cry that you might remember in the Obama campaign, which goes back to the labor movement, particularly of migrant workers in the United States, of si se puede, and that then sort of morphed into this idea of a collective podemos, we can, as opposed to this sort of more uh, si se puede idea. So um, the protests in Spain actually influenced and um, were an inspiration for a lot of Greek protesters a couple of years later. So um, the austerity measures started in uh, 2010 with a huge debt crisis in Greece. And again, plans to cut public spending, raise taxes in exchange for a 110 billion, dollar, a billion euro bailout. Then Greece saw some of the largest protests that they had witnessed since 1973. Um, there were protests again against corruption against austerity, about the economic precarity that many people were feeling, very, very high unemployment, particularly among young people who didn't see much of a future in Greece. And that brought about um, Syriza, the rise of the current party in power, which is very much a left-wing populist party. They're anti-capitalist, anti-system, um, sort of in a neo-Marxist uh, tradition. So you can see there that these two things, how they played out certainly from um, the Mediterranean perspective. So some scholars have said that left-wing populism tends to be a little bit more stronger in some of the Mediterranean countries, whereas right-wing populism tends to be stronger in Central and Eastern and in Northern Europe. Maybe, maybe not. We can discuss that or debate it. So as I said, this sort of perfect storm coming together, first the economic crisis in 2008, and then the wave of immigration in 2011, some statistics here, many of you have who've been to uh, some of the various panel discussions on the refugee situation and um, displacement these days know that the numbers are really staggering. 65 million people in 2018 are displaced globally, according to the United Nations. 40 million displaced internally, 25 million refugees, 3 million asylum seekers. 85% of these are coming from the developing world. And of those, 57% are coming from just three countries, South Sudan, Afghanistan, and Syria. So this really was a strain on a lot of countries that were already suffering from the effects of the economic crisis of three years prior. 
The top hosting countries, though, not in Europe, but are actually Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan, where there are over a million people in these countries in refugee camps hoping or applying for refugee status in Europe, where the conditions um, certainly are um, a little bit more favorable. And here is a, a graphic that might be a little bit hard to see from the back, but it just gives you a little bit of a sense. Here are the countries of origin. You probably can't read it. Syria, Kosovo, Afghanistan, Albania, Iraq, Eritrea are the top countries where people are fleeing from. And then these are the countries that have taken in the largest number of refugees. So you see that Germany, far and away, has taken in the largest numbers. Hungary, as well as the first country of the European Union where um, uh, or in the Schengen zone, where people are coming in through the so-called Balkan route, and then Greece and Italy for those crossing the Mediterranean in the south. So huge numbers here that affect a lot of these countries in the south. Many of them are making their way to Germany. Sweden also has taken in a very, very large number of um, uh, asylum seekers as well. And so um, moving on then to central to Germany, essentially France and Scandinavian countries. So populism is um, on the rise then in, in many countries throughout um, uh, Europe. But I also um, wanted to point out that it's not something that is exclusively male, which is also a very interesting phenomenon. There are increasingly a number of women leaders of these populist movements. So here we have Marine Le Pen of the National Rally, the former Front National, which has rebranded itself a little bit. Um, the woman in the middle is Pia, you're gonna, my, our Swedish guests are going to have to help me here a little bit, Kjarsgaard, close, yeah, uh, who is the um, leader of the Danish People's Party. She's actually the Speaker of Parliament in Denmark and is uh, a member of this, what's considered an anti-immigrant, um, pretty far right leaning um, party. And then Alice Weidel, who is the second female leader, actually, of the Alternative for Germany. Uh, Frauke Petri was her predecessor, and there was some internal fighting. But they've had actually two leaders um, in the uh, Alternative for Germany, um, uh, the far right uh, party there. As I mentioned, there are very strong anti-immigrant tendencies and policies among um, these parties. So just to give you an idea of what some of their party platforms um, have to say. France's national rally, um, part of their most recent platform, calls for a reduction of legal immigration from 200,000 a year to 10,000 a year. So a drastic reduction in the number of legal immigrants. An end to the European Schengen area. Some of you may know the Schengen area is where there are free movement within the countries that have signed this accord. So it's not the same as the European Union. Not every country in the European Union is in Schengen. Not every country in Schengen is in the European Union. Not everyone has the euro, is in the Schengen, or it's complicated. But it's a different sort of zone, a free movement zone. But they want out of the Schengen so they can control their border um, to an even greater uh, degree. And a reinstatement of border checks and border controls, something that has not existed since the late 1990s. They want to give priority to French citizens over immigrants or uh, asylum seekers for jobs and for social housing. And interestingly, also end dual citizenship as part of their um, platform. But they also, despite being sort of a politically right-wing party, they do have a lot of strong socialist tendencies um, in their platform as well. So um, they are very strong on family benefits. And the government then giving money for um, children, for, um, for, for women uh, as uh, um, as, as being parents, I'm trying to think of the word Elterngeld is what it's called in German. I'm trying to think of the English word for it, but giving money for those, uh, for families, basically, and for children, child support, but again, with the caveat that it's available to French families, right? So they're a very nationalist, but also very socialist in this um, as well. Unrestricted access to abortion is also part of their platform, not normally something you would associate with the conservative far right. And also, quite odd to me at least, um, ending restrictive internet laws. So they are in favor of file sharing. So this again is sort of breaking down sort of anti-capitalist in this sense of the control of large tech companies. And so they're very much about this. Um, so the policies are really kind of all over the place. I mean, if you look at, at traditional sort of mainstream right and left parties, 
these ideas can, are some are on the far left, some are on the far right, some are perhaps a little bit more um, centrist to that degree. The alternative for Germany, um, their 2016 party platform, this is a sentence directly from their platform that I think really gets at the heart of what right-wing populist ideology is about. And they say, we want to preserve the dignity of the individual, families with children, our Occidental Christian culture, our language and tr tradition in a peaceful, democratic, and sovereign nation state of the German people. Right? And so this idea, they're talking about a nation state, I mean, this is hearkening back to 19th century ideas, right? And a nation state of the German people, right? So this also, for Germans, touches on some very, very unpleasant terminology and wording, talking about a nation only for the German people. They're talking about protect, protecting their Western Christian culture. This is clearly um, about Muslim immigrants, but there's also problems with anti-Semitism in a lot of these parties as well. Some of them go out of their way to, to, to talk about Judeo-Christian values, but yet a lot of their supporters are also anti-Semitic as well as being um, Islamophobic. Supporting families um, there, so um, family values, traditional values, um, et cetera. As far as their party platform, also fascinating to look at some of the things that they are interested in. They are calling for a uh, referendum on the euro. That is, they think, you might remember that Greece at one point was thinking about leaving the, the eurozone, and they think that Germany should leave the eurozone so that they can control their monetary policy and not be burdened by the Italians and the, and the Greeks and the others that have debt problems. They want to strengthen the police, so this very law and order kind of thing expulsion of all allied troops out of Germany. So they think that any troops stationed there that are not German should leave and only German troops should be in Germany and German troops should stay in Germany and not be deployed to other places. So again, very closed protectionist ideas um, about, uh, about the military and the role of the military. Stronger ties to Russia, traditional family values, and German culture instead of multiculturalism. Again, so this focus on traditional German values. But they too also have some other policies that um, strike us from our, perhaps our traditional sensibilities as a little bit kind of all over the board. So they're opposed to wind energy in particular and say that the insanity of wind energy is out of control and they're opposed to any expansion of that. But there's a whole page about sustainable fisheries and forest management and how they need to protect the German countryside, the forests, the fisheries. Again, something that more would be aligned with the Green Party than you would find in traditional right-wing parties. They're also opposed to agricultural subsidies and say that farmers should compete on the free market, but they also want greater diversity of seeds and plants and are opposed to the multinational corporations' control of the seed industry. And I didn't realize until this week that this is also a big issue in Brexit, that the pro-Brexiteers are very much about seeds and a group, organizations like Monsanto that have control over what they see as um, monopolizing the diversity, the biodiversity of, of seeds. So again, this is something that you might find in a Green Party agenda that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find um, perhaps in uh, the far right. So some of the consequences, and I'll wrap it up here um, with this. One of them is the rise of what are called illiberal democracies, right? So we talked about the liberal world order, and there's been more and more talk of illiberal democracies. And this goes back to an article by um, someone you may know who's a commentator now on CNN, Farid Zakaria, who wrote an essay talking about the difference between constitutional liberalism and liberal democracies. And he said that constitutional liberalism is about um, limitation of power. So the Constitution is there to make sure that one person doesn't gain too much power, right? Whereas liberal democracy is about the accumulation of power, right? So you can have, you can vote in leaders who then want to change the Constitution in order to increase their power or increase their stay in power. We've seen this in Turkey with uh, um, Erdogan, the president of Turkey, has had a, several constitutional referenda to change the constitution. In Egypt as well. Um, in Hungary, we've seen some changes to the constitution as well in order to consolidate power somewhat. 
So liberalism is about granting civil, civil liberties, freedom of the press, the speech, um, right to assembly. Illiberalism limits these liberties while maintaining the democratic vote. So the idea here that populists say that I was democratically elected, this is the will of the people, so the changes that I'm making then are legitimate because I'm doing the will of the people. And I need to make these changes in order to change the system of the elites who have rigged it in a particular way that goes against the people. Right? So this is a common sort of discourse that you hear in um, things about illiberal democracy. So at the time, Zakaria was really concerned more about Latin America and Yugoslavia at the time he was writing it. But he foresaw a lot of the changes that were happening in Eastern Europe. Um, Eastern European countries, as we talked about, went through a liberalization, liberalization period without a lot of democracy. Think of Hungary, Czechoslovakia, and Poland before the fall of the wall. We're starting to move more towards uh, liberal. But afterwards, the post-communist democracies and ethnic tensions really began to collapse in many ways in Yugoslavia. And now we're seeing more ethnic tensions, particularly in places like Hungary or in Slovakia, although they just had a, an election that tossed out their populist leader. And Zakaria notes, in strong societies without strong traditions of multi-ethnic groups or assimilation, it is easiest to organize support along racial, ethnic, or religious lines. Once an ethnic group is in power, it tends to exclude other ethnic groups. This is exactly what we saw happen in Yugoslavia, in the breakup of Yugoslavia, the civil war that resulted, and is the danger about some of these populist rhetoric of closed borders, of maintaining a sense of cultural tradition, cultural purity, that it privileges one ethnic group, the majority, over the minority populations um, in those countries. And my final two examples about this are Eastern Europe populists. Um, here on the left, we have Jaroslav Kaczynski, who is the president, was the president of Poland, and then perhaps one of the most notorious right-wing populists uh, Viktor Orban of the Fidesz party in Hungary. And I want to give you a couple of quotes from Viktor Orban just to sort of crystallize some of this, uh, these ideas. This is from a speech that he gave at a Romanian summer camp, actually, in 2014. And very interesting what he says about it. And he embraces, so even, this idea of illiberal democracy and says the new state that we are constructing in Hungary is an illiberal state. So he recognizes that we're breaking down and eliminating some of the personal liberties that were part of this liberal world order. It's a non-liberal state. It does not reject the fundamental principles of liberalism, such as freedom, but it does not make this ideology the central element of state organization, but instead includes a different, special, national approach. Right? So nationalism, as opposed to liberty and equality for all people, is more central. In another speech he gave, and here you can see again this idea about the elites that he's uh, protesting against. The main danger to Europe's future, he says, does not come from those who want to come here, immigrants, but from Brussels' fanatics of internationalism. We cannot allow Brussels to place itself above the law. We shall not allow it to force upon us the bitter fruit of its cosmopolitan immigration policy. We shall not allow others to tell us whom we can let into our home and country whom we will live alongside, and whom we will share our country with. We know how these things go. First, we allow them to tell us whom we must take in. Then they force us to serve foreigners in our country. In the end, we find ourselves being told to pack up and leave our own land. So this is the president of Hungary, which is a member of the European Union, saying the greatest danger to Europe is Brussels and is the European Union in and of itself. And the European Union really doesn't have an answer or a response and don't really know what to do with Viktor Orban, except hope that some change, perhaps, uh, is on the horizon. And then finally, Poland's Law and Justice Party, similar types of things. Um, their president, Andrzej Duda, has said that the EU is an imaginary community, and he doesn't mean this in a positive uh, way, um, from which Poland does not gain much. He's attempted, or the party, the Law and Justice Party, has attempted to dismiss the entire constitutional court, made it illegal to accuse the Polish nation of complicity in the Holocaust, a very controversial law that was passed last year, rejected EU immigration quotas, and claims that Germany and Angela Merkel tolerates Nazis, which are destabilizing Poland. So that has not helped Polish-German relations, as you might imagine. 
So finally, a few last other consequences of this. A lot of these parties also call for more direct democracy, this idea of giving the people a vote on this, with the idea that the majority will vote to sort of protect values, traditions, the local identity, and reject immigration, multiculturalism, et cetera. There's an appeal to Judeo-Christian values and to the values of Europe, the Enlightenment tradition, et cetera. Rejection of multiculturalism and disengagement, as we've seen, from the European Union. Think Brexit, think NATO, think NAFTA. Limiting treaties and participation in national organizations. More law and order. Many times, tendencies towards strongman authoritarianism, as we see in Hungary or perhaps Poland. And then that often spurs the right of right-wing racist groups where it often becomes violent. Not political parties, but community groups, organizations. You have them in Germany, Pegida, Legida, um, Hogesa, lots of these different things. So the last thing that I'll say, perhaps anticipating some questions, well, what, what to do? Right? How can this be countered, or how can the concerns, the problems, the issues um, be addressed? And I would say, and I would argue, and this is where I'll leave it to open up for debate or discussion, is that traditional parties need to understand the economic impact, the people who find their voice in these populist parties. Why is that? They need to understand these things that we talked about before, the consequences of outsourcing, of depressed wages, dominance of transnational corporations. They need to make a stronger case for political liberalism, why the rights of all people, the freedom of all people, are crucial to the success of any nation, right? And not appeal to sort of tribal loyalties. And they need to argue for the advantages of multilateralism as opposed to unilateralism. They need to talk more about the benefits of globalization and how collective action can be better than unilateral. Thank you very much for listening and your patience.